others for our practice finals. And um, let's go ahead. And my, uh, I would say my recollection, but I actually looked at the video this morning and we stopped at question 45. We hadn't gotten to 46 yet, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at question 46. And we have this. Uh, we didn't do 45? Okay. Okay, so let's look at 45 now. Okay. 44. 45, Elliott Company. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one then. And um, they can sell products A and Z, but it has limited production capacity. Okay, we can produce eight units of A per hour or 10 units of Z per hour, and we have production of 20,000 hours. Contribution margin per unit for A is $12, and contribution. Uh, for Z is $10. Now that's a little misleading because we need to figure out the contribution margin, what, per hour on these problems, right? Okay, so don't just go with the one with the larger contribution margin and they say, well, what's the most profitable mix? So we come down and they tell us that we should really produce, what, zero units of A and 200,000 units of Z is the answer and that is counter to what you would have thought just by looking at the contribution margin per unit because when you look at the contribution margin per hour it's what it's twelve dollars per unit for a ten dollars per unit per z, for z but what we can produce ten units in an hour of z versus only eight units in an hour uh, for a and so our contribution margin per unit is what? Is $100 per unit. And since we can use all of our production and sell all of those units of Z, we should go ahead and do what? Simply produce uh, the 20, 200,000 units, I should say, of Z because it has a higher contribution margin per unit and it can uh, we have the capacity to actually obviously handle all those how did I get the what um, well because I have what don't I have 200,000 hours of production available I mean, uh, 20,000 production, excuse me, hours available, right? And it's what, 10 units of Z per hour? So if it's 10 units of Z per hour um, and it's what, uh, 10 units per hour, that would have been 200,000. So I use up all my production time on those units of Z because it has a higher contribution margin per unit. Uh, I should say per hour of $100. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's jump ourselves to what? Number 40. Now we're 46. Okay. And so when we look at 46, and sorry for the dancing screen here, I just, uh, my mouse, I keep, for some reason the battery keeps teasing me. First it acts like it's okay, then it's not okay. So I'm not sure what I need to do there. But uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And we have this uh, Garfield company, and it's considering eliminating its backup division, uh, which reported an operating loss for the year of 42,000. Remember when we look at what's reported as a loss or the net income for a particular division, that is different than what we use when we actually evaluate that division, right? Okay, so it's showing a loss, but that's an accounting loss, but from an evaluating standpoint, we're only going to consider avoidable cost and whether or not we want to keep that division, right? And so we come down here and um, we say that they had 960,000 of sales, variable costs were 475. So if we get rid of that division, we're going to lose what? 
we're going to lose 960,000 of sales, but we're going to be able to eliminate these variable costs, aren't we? Okay, so they're just bringing those numbers down here. This is the solution part. And then what? Then we come down and they tell us fixed costs were 527, and they tell us that if the backup div division is dropped, 40% of the fixed costs allocated could be eliminated. So that would be considered a what? a avoidable cost so we take the 527,000 and we multiply that by what by 0.4 and when we do that gives us the actual fixed cost that would be avoidable since they say 40 percent would go away if we got rid of the division so our impact on operating income if you get rid of that 960,000 of sales but you only get rid of 475,000 of variable costs 210,800 of the fixed costs that's the 40 percent of the total that would be eliminated we would actually reduce the overall contribution to our operating income by 274,200 so that's not something you want to do right so even though when you're looking at a financial report, which is typically an external report, remember I've talked about the Security Exchange Commission requires for public companies that they have information about their segments being disclosed in their financial statements and their footnotes. They have to put in segment information. And from an accounting standpoint, the accounting rules say that you're supposed to allocate certain avoidable costs to each, excuse me, unavoidable costs to each segment for that reporting purpose. But that is not how we internally, which is what we study here in um, you know, Business Administration 101B, internally, that's not the way you analyze it, right? You analyze what is it contributing. And then you only consider what? The avoidable costs. OK? OK, good. Let's go ahead. Let's look at this next one now. And uh, again, Garfield Corporation. I don't care for this question, but I think that I saw one on your uh, final, and this is why I included it. I myself, if I was choosing the questions, I would get rid of this one because I think it's a silly analysis, to be honest with you. But anyway, we sit over here and we have what? We have this Garfield company has a piece of equipment with a book value of forty thousand and a remaining useful life of four years. At the end of four years, the equipment will have a zero salvage value. The market value of the equipment is currently 22,000. Garfield can purchase a new machine for 120,000 and receive 22,000 in return for trading the old machine. The new machine will reduce variable costs by 19,000 per year over a four year period. Uh, the total increase or decrease in net income by replacing the current machine and you can see the answer is a $22,000 decrease, but let's just go ahead and take a look here in that what? We're going to have the cost of buying the new machine. That's $120,000 right there. That's the cost of buying the new machine, so we'll have that cash outflow right now. Then what? We'll get a recovery of $22,000 on that because we're going to trade in the old machine, right? Then what? Then we'll have a reduction in our variable cost of 19,000 a year for four years, and that gives us what? This 76,000 that's going to come in. So even if we have that additional amount that comes in, less the salvage value, we're still going to have a decrease, and we're saying a decrease in our net income of 22,000. Okay. Now. Um, we ignore the time value of money here, and I ask you, why? I mean, if we have the concept of the time value of money, why would we ignore it? Okay. Now, maybe if you're trying to do this on the back of a napkin, this would be okay, and it would lead to the same conclusion, don't buy this machine, because I know that if I discount the cash flows like we did in Chapter 11, then I'm going to have, what, an even deeper loss on this, because I know that the discounted cash flows are less than the undiscounted cash flows, right? So in terms of trying to quickly make a decision on it, okay. But in terms of trying to definitively answer, and even saying what's the effect on income, that's not an income number. I don't know what you call that number because we don't expense equipment when we buy it, do we? So it's not even really an income number. So um, there's a lot of 
a lot to be desired with this particular question, but I did see something similar to this. So if you don't deal, deal with the time value of money, in a question like this, how would you be able to deal with the time value of money if they don't give you the present value factors, right? Anyway, so uh, you had to ignore time value of money. Okay. Okay. Let's take a look at this one. Outside supplier offers to provide beta with all the Z units it needs at $58 per unit. If uh, beta buys from the supplier, it'll still incur 40% of the overhead cost. So what should uh, beta do here? So we have to pick up all of our variable costs, don't we? So is direct materials variable? That would be a question. Okay, so direct material is what? Variable, so it's $10. Okay. Is direct labor variable? Yes, it is. So I pick that up. And then they tell me that overhead has what? Both a, um, well, I don't know if it's a fixed and variable, but if we um, get it uh, by the beta, we would still incur what? 40% of that overhead, so they're kind of treating that as a fixed, and so we would be able to get rid of what? 60% of the overhead here, All right? So 50 times 0.6 is what it's costing us to uh, produce this uh, beta, whatever this thing is, or Z, or whatever the heck the name of this unit is, this Z units, right? because we'd only be able to get rid of, uh, we'll still incur 40%, but we would be able to get rid of this 60%. So 50 times 0 0.6 is $30. And so you add that up, that's 60 bucks. Even I can do that one in my head. And so what? If they're going to sell it to it for 58, we should go ahead and what? Buy since uh, we're going to incur $60 if we make it, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this 49. And we've got this uh, Brandy, our Bandy Corporation owns a machine that produces uh, these uh, lawn games. And uh, production time for the croquet set is 10 units per hour. And volleyball game is 8 units per hour. The machine capacity is 1,500 hours per year, okay? That's going to be an important number because what? We are not going to be able to produce any items that exceed that 1,500 uh, hours per year, right? Both products are sold to a single customer who has agreed to buy all the company's output up to a maximum of 4,000 croquet sets and 10,000 volleyball games. Now this question is helping you out by the way it's written and that they're already indicating to you, hey, you're going to have to decide how much of these to make because they said they'd buy all of our output up to a maximum, which means that we're going to be able to sell them all this. The question is what? What is our mix of products based on the total capacity of the company? Selling prices and variable costs per unit are as shown. Based on this information, what is the most profitable sales mix? So we come over, let's look at the solution, and we have the selling price for the croquet, selling price for the um, volleyball game, and then the variable cost. Was that given in the problem? I mean, that information, not the table wasn't, but what? Oh, no, they had to give it. So the table was also given, right? Okay, so once you had that information, then what? Then you would go ahead and you're going to figure out what is the contribution margin per hour. 75, you can see up there for the sales on the croquet set and the variable cost are what? 42, and then that gives me contribution margin per unit of $33. 62 for the selling price, 25 for the variable cost for the volleyball game. That gives me contribution margin of $37 per unit. I multiply that times the number of units 
per hour we can produce and the croquet set has the larger contribution margin per hour, doesn't it? Okay, and so what do I do? I go ahead then and I say, okay, if that's the case, I can sell 4,000 units. Each unit, um, I can produce, I should say, 10 units per hour. So that's what? 400 hours I would produce or the 400 units. But I needed to get that 400 hours, didn't I? 4,000 units is what I can sell, 10 units per hour. So to produce 4,000 units, I'm going to use what? 400 of that total 1,500 hours that are available. There's only 1,500 hours total available, right? And so I go ahead and I say, well, if I use up 400 hours to produce those 4,000 croquet sets, then I want to do that first because that has a higher contribution margin per unit. Then I have 1,100 hours left that I can use to do what? To produce the item with the lower contribution margin per unit, which is the volleyball set, right? All right, so I go ahead and I say, well, if that's the case, 1,100 hours and I can produce 8 per hour, that means I would produce 8,800 volleyball games and what? We've already determined the 4,000 croquet sets, right? Question? Okay, step one. Higher contribution margin per unit, right? Yeah, I got that. Okay. Well, I'm talking to a, cl a classroom full of people right now. So step number one is what? Contribution margin per unit, the higher one, right? Once we choose that, then we go ahead and we say, okay, fine. I want to produce, I want to be, I, they tell me I can sell 4,000 units of this, um, of this croquet set, right? It is. It's $330 per unit. I mean, per hour, I should say. $330 per unit. And I want to sell as many of those as I can first, right? And this buyer is only going to buy 4,000 of them. The buyer of these croquet sets is only willing to buy what? 4,000 croquet sets, right? Okay, and so I know I can sell those 4,000, right? Because the guy said he would buy them. He's agreed to buy 4,000. I presumably, I guess, have a contract with them to buy up to a maximum of 4,000. Okay, so if that's the case and I come down, then I know I can sell 4,000 and I know that I can... Um, produce uh, 400 uh, for, that that'll use up 400 hours but I know I can sell them those 400 those I can produce and sell them those 4,000 because I have 1500 hours of capacity don't I right so I'm going to produce those 4,000 I know I can sell them and the good news is that only uses up 400 hours of my total capacity right right Okay, so then I go ahead and I say, well, if I have 1,500 hours of total capacity and I only use 400 for the uh, croquet set, that means I still have 1,100 hours left that I can now use to produce the volleyball game, right? Right? And I can produce eight volleyball game sets per hour, so that means I can produce 8,800 of the volleyball games. I know that I could have, you know, sold more, but I don't have any more factory capacity, right? Yeah, okay. I just had backwards because I thought that the contribution margin per unit was the same as the um, It has a higher contribution margin per unit. That's the trick. But because it, I have to use up more hours to produce it, that causes it to have a lower contribution margin per hour. And so, again, the takeaway from those questions, they kind of they kind of bait you in by making, you know, the contribution margin higher. But then it seems like in most of these problems, 
the contribution margin per hour gets higher with the uh, with the one that has the lower contribution margin per unit. I think they do that on purpose just to make you mess up. And it could happen in practice that way too, right? I'm not saying that's a made up uh, potential situation. It could happen in practice as well, right? And so you pick the one with the higher contribution margin per unit, uh, and that's relevant, of course, and you always have a limited uh, uh, factory capacity. I mean, we don't have an unlimited factory capacity, obviously, and so um, that's a, a relevant consideration that we don't have unlimited amount of factory time. Uh, if you notice, a lot of the problems where we were just dealing with one product, a lot of times the question said, this is the only product they produce, and they call that out so that we don't have to sit there, hey, just go make as many of them units as you can, right? And they'll, or they'll say in there that this only uses up 75% of the capacity of the company so that we don't have to worry about cutting ourselves off at some point. Whereas here, we need to worry about the capacity because we're going to allocate that between the two products. Okay? And this is a real consideration that a company would need to do. They might be more sophisticated about it than this, but they would be doing some sort of thought process like this. Okay? We're good? Okay, good. Again, guys, I don't remember. I mean, this may be the same exact question that you got on the test, or when I took it out of the test bank, it was right next to one that was like the uh, exam question, and that's why I stuck it here. Okay, so again, I want to stress working every single one of these questions through once, twice, maybe three times before your test, and I know you have other finals and stuff, but uh, I'm telling you, this is going to get you a potential to get an, a nice grade out of a 101B anyway. Okay. Okay, couple of word problems here to finish us out. Question 50. Okay, the potential benefit lost by taking a specific action when two or more alternatives exist. Opportunity cost, right? Okay, when you get offered a chance to, uh, you know, be a movie star and you turn that down so that you can complete your, you know, bachelor's degree and go on and get your master's degree and all that, your opportunity cost is the millions you could have made as a movie star because your true love is accounting, right? Okay, all right, that would be your opportunity cost. Okay, and then um, what, number 51? The amounts that you paid for your tuition up until now, if you chose the what? The movie star option, that would be what? That would be a sunk cost and it wouldn't be relevant, right? Would not be relevant to your decision. Okay. Questions on those? All right, guys, again, um, what I would do, we're going to go through a couple of those other ones. Um, I'm not going to save that. We're going to go through a couple of those other ones. Uh, i got to get the file. I guess I closed the file up uh, for the other chapter. But let me say that the way I would work through the things, while well, I'm just saying this now while I'm thinking of it, I would work backwards through the practice finals. So this one, the mock, and then whatever it was, three, two, one, and then go through the chapters, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, right? And then I would go ahead and maybe go through this mock exam plus these extra questions that I'm going to put up right now because together that really constitutes a full set of mock questions, okay? So you would be doing that sort of Sunday night you know, Monday morning type of thing, finishing that up, and then you walk into class like this, not because you're hungover, but because what? <laughs> but because you don't want anything to spill out of your head, and then you sit there and you dump everything on the exam. You should be in good shape, okay? The only question is what? Timing. I really think they give, us, they give you too many questions. 50 questions, I think, is too much for two hours, but I don't have that control. They're asking you, in my opinion, to work at a rate that I would expect a CPA candidate to work taking the CPA exam, okay? And I don't think you need to hone your skills to that level at this stage, okay? But um, I don't know. They want to train you to be Olympic athletes. I think right now you're still in college. 
go. So I guess you could be an Olympic athlete and be younger than college age, but uh, especially if you're doing gymnastics, what are they, like 10 or something? Okay, but let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, these questions, okay? And as I said, uh, these are chapter 7 and 6 because we didn't, I didn't have time to find any for the mock exam because I was up against the clock when I was putting it together, but here's some that will work together, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And they tell us here that we need, uh, we're producing this garlic gravy. And um, they talk about the different units for the months. And then they tell us that five grams of garlic are needed for every jar of gravy. And they like to have enough garlic on hand at the end of the month to cover 10% of the months following production requirements for garlic, how many grams of garlic should G purchase during the month? Now, when you look at the solutions on these guys, and be careful because the solution uh, is fascinated with this uh, notion of having to multiply times five every single time. And I don't understand why whoever the graduate student was that they paid, you know, 10 bucks an hour to do this to solve these problems, why that person felt it was necessary to multiply by five every single time. I would not do it that way. I would do all my calculations by unit and then multiply up by pounds at the end so I don't make some, you know, annoying mistake with my calculator as I'm going along. And then you're like, where was my mistake? And then all of a sudden you're having to start all over again on this question and we're up against the clock on time, right? So my recommendation would be to say, well, if they want to produce and... Um, Again, I'm hampered by my lack of mouse capacity here. If they want to sit there and produce, they're asking me for May. Okay, they're asking me for May, and it's how many units in May? 80,000 units in May. Okay, so I just go ahead and I start with that 80,000. This is the way I like to work them when I have to convert it up to a different amount of materials. And then they say that they want to have what? So I know I have to have the production for the period. And then they say that they have a what? A desired ending inventory of materials. And this desired ending inventory is going to be 10% of the next month's capacity, right? So since June is after May and we want 75,000 in June, that means we need what? 7,500 in ending inventory? Okay, good. So that's my desired ending inventory. And so what happens? Now I go ahead and that means I have total needs. And I have total needs of, if I'm doing my math correctly, 87,500. Okay. Okay, good. Then what? Then I would have had some units on hand as beginning inventory, right? And the units I would have had as beginning inventory, and be careful, guys, it's not what you would have needed to start April. It's what you needed to start May, which is 10% of May's, right? Okay, so I go ahead and I take that 80,000 multiply that by what? 0.1. That gives me 8,000. Okay, so I go ahead and I subtract that off because I would have started the month with it, right? Right, 87,500 divided by, I mean, uh, subtract off 8,000 is 79,500. Thank you. 79,500, good. But I have to give them the answer in pounds, don't I? And they tell me, or grams, I guess. And they tell me it's what? Five grams per unit. So if I multiply that whole thing by five, I get what? Huh? 
you get 397,500. Okay. So I just do 1 times 5, right? As opposed to having to do it 3 times. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at number... And when you look at the solution, guys, just to be uh, just to be clear, notice what they took. They took the same numbers that we had for each one of these, but then they multiplied it by what? By five. Distributive law of multiplication says you don't have to do that. You can do all the work essentially inside the parentheses first. Essentially is what we did, and then multiply it by five at the end. You get the same answer, right? Okay. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at number two. And uh, we've got this. Oh, I picked this stupid question again. Forget it. I'm not going to ask you this question. I'm not going to waste any time with this question. Let's look at this one. Okay. And... Um, they want to know what the January cash disbursements are for my manufacturing overhead, right? Okay. And so they tell us that the direct labor budget indicates that we need 7,100 hours of direct labor in January. The variable overhead rate is what? Is $1.80 per unit. The company budgeted fixed manufacturing overhead of $102,950 per month, but that includes depreciation. So if we want the what cash disbursements, we need to back that depreciation part out of the fixed overhead portion, don't we? Because we want what cash disbursements? Does cash use? Does depreciation use cash? Depreciation does not use cash, so we need to adjust for that. So it's a pretty easy question. We simply take the number of hours that they're going to need, the 7,100. That's up there. Please don't make me scroll back up. Let's see. I might be able to scroll one click. There it is. 7,100. I take that times what? Times 1.8 per hour, the variable. That gives me this uh, $12,780. The way they do it is they go ahead, they pick up what? The entire fixed, that's all of the fixed, including the, the uh, I mean all of the overhead, including the fixed. They pick up all of that. All of it is fixed, excuse me. They pick up all of the fixed, but then they do what? They back out the depreciation portion because that is not going to use cash, right? Does depreciation use cash? No. So they take that out of the fix, and that gives them the cash disbursement for the overhead, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's try another one then. Home Corporation will open a new store, and based on experience from other retail outlets um, I see when I first read this earlier I was like well why would competitors give them this information but I see they're gonna open a new store and they're talking about what their other outlets do because I'm pictured them going to a co potential competitor and saying so how much do you distribute and then, you know the competitor would be oh the the nice competitor would say get out of here, right? The mean competitor would say, here you go, <laughs> watch this, right? And so, you know, I was, thought it was a competitor at first. I mean, this is a dumb question. But I see it's another store of the same company that's being opened, right? Okay, Home Depot, whatever. Okay, and so what happens? They want the total cash receipts that we will get, okay? Now, this one's a little different from some of the other ones we saw earlier for Chapter 6 and that it literally has a column for my cash sales and my credit sales, right? So if you want to know how much cash you're going to get in April, the first no-brainer thing is, well, I guess I better get the cash sales for April, right? Because that's going to be cash coming in. And then they tell me that they get 70% of the credit sales in the month 
following the month of sales. So now I'm going to pick up what? I'm going to go ahead and pick up 70% in um, April of the March credit sales, right? So I just pick up that 60,000, the March credit sales, and I'm going to get 70% of that in April, right? So that's 42,000. Then I go ahead and the question tells me um, that the balance is collected in the second month following the sale. So that means that I would have gotten 70% of the February sales in March and the remaining 30% in April, right? For February, I would have got 70% in March because you get 70% in the month after. And then I would have got the remaining 30% in April, right? So I just pick up 30% of April. I go ahead and I add those all together and that gives me the 97,000. Question? No? Okay, good. Let's go ahead. Let's click down to another one. Aren't these fun? <laughs> You'll have some like this on your test. Don't worry. Huh? What do you mean? Oh, is there? Can you imagine that? Okay. Um, I guess what's missing is the amount of labor that you need per unit and the what? The cost per, okay? Okay. So that's okay because um, we can still, there's the, the reason I selected this question um, and I'd like, I was doing this this morning and, you know, <laughs> no mouse working, phones ringing, printers won't work. Anything can happen in that. I'm lucky I found my way up to the classroom this morning, okay? So anyway, um, the takeaway from this question is what? It is the potential that they'll give you the number of units, right? And then you have to turn that units into what? Labor hours, and then you can turn those hours into what? Into the actual cost by knowing the amount per hour. Okay, that's the takeaway here because I think in a lot of the ones that we practiced in the, uh, no, I guess we did have that in some of those other ones where they gave you the units and you had to turn the units into hours. That's my only point. Don't expect them to give you the hours every time. They could give you uh, the units and you'll have to convert units into hours by figuring out how much of the hour it takes to create a unit, right? And uh, in this case, I guess it was... In this case, it was more than an hour. It was 3.5 hours per unit, right? Okay, and the unit part, oh, I think that was the other reason I picked it. Um, because I think in the ones we did in the homework and the other quizzes for Chapter 6 and stuff and some of the other practice finals, um, they get not Chapter 6, but Chapter 7, they gave us the um, units. They just gave us the units, right? Here you had to do that unit thing first. How much are they going to produce plus what they want to have as an ending minus what they had on hand at the beginning. So you had to ramp up to that to get the units to get the hours to multiply times the amount per hour. Okay. So that was the takeaways there. And I apologize for not having the... Uh, 3.5 hours per unit and the $16 per hour. Yeah, that would have been that would have been important to be able to answer this. Huh? Got the units. Yeah, good. And that's the hardest part, right? Okay. All right. So what you do is you throw a party and after everyone's drunk, give them this one and see if they can answer it. All right. Just kidding. Don't get anybody drunk. Okay, this one, I didn't give you multiple choice choices on this because uh, I didn't really need them. Okay, again, multiple choice choices are there really to maybe kind of help you, but they're more to help me so I can give you a multiple choice test. And so you can practice pretty good with these. And they want the unit cost under absorption versus variable. So now we're into Chapter 6, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's figure it out. First, they wanted to show your work, okay? And they wanted it under uh, absorption. So let's do absorption first. I'll just put abs over here. 
it's absorption okay and uh, do I need to pick up the direct materials got to pick that up that's eighty dollars right that's a variable cost okay good do I need to pick up the direct labor yes I do that's a variable cost so I got to pick that up the 82 do I need to pick up the variable manufacturing yes I do under absorptions right what is it two dollars okay good now do I pick up selling an administrator don't pick those up those are not product costs hello chapter one chapter two whatever right okay okay good what about though I'm not gonna pick up the fixed selling and administrative we know that right what about the fixed manufacturing overhead under absorption yes right so I go ahead and I take the one hundred and seventy six thousand dollars and I divide that by the number of units produced which is what four thousand that gives me how much per unit? Forty-four dollars per unit. So I pick that up, don't I? And when I do the math on that, we don't have the choices here, but I get what? I get this 208. There's the answer right there. Okay. For variables, what happens? Only difference is I do not pick up the fixed manufacturing does not come down that's the difference between the two isn't it okay okay good come over let's take a look at this one let's look at this Carlos manufacturing and uh, they say assume direct labor is a variable cost here which we've always treated it as such and um, they want for the first question using that information they want what is the total cost that would be assigned to the finished goods inventory uh, at the fir for the first year of operations. Let's see. So let's go ahead and let's just look here. I think it's a little bit easier for us to figure this out, although I don't like entirely how they did the solution here. But it was direct materials were $7 per. Just going back up into what the problem said. Do we pick up the direct materials? It's variable. We pick it up. We pick up the direct labor per unit is what? $3, right? We pick up the variable manufacturing. 18, good. We pick up what? The fixed manufacturing, which is the $450,000 was told in the table, divided by what? Divided by the 8,000 uh, 8, units. That gives me my cost per unit of $84.25, doesn't it? Now, to get this answer, I would go ahead and I would take that 84.25. And let's just look back at the table because I'm not exactly sure I like the way they presented this here. So let's just go back up to the table and let's understand what they did. They did what? They produced how many units? 8,000, but they sold what? 7,500, didn't they? Okay, so to me it's a little easier to see here than that if they produced 8,000 but they only sold 7,500, then that means that there are how many units left in ending inventory? There's 500 units left in ending inventory, and this 500 times the 84.25 per unit should give me that number, right? Okay. Okay, good. All right, so let's go ahead then and let's jump to the next one. And the next one, surprise, surprise, is what? Under variable costing, what is the total cost that would be assigned to the finished goods inventory at the end of the year of operation? And the difference here is going to be what? Just look at the solution. They don't pick up the fixed manufacturing overhead, do they? They don't pick it up, and so it's just the $28, and it's the $28 times what? The 500 units that would be in ending inventory, and that should give me this 14000 Okay. Okay, good. And then this next one just says, well, look, 
if your absorption income is 118,125, what would be the variables operating income? And the difference is going to be what? The fact that we expensed our fixed manufacturing overhead, didn't we? Didn't we expense our fixed manufacturing overhead? So what happens for those now 5625 per unit? That was the 450 divided by the 8,000. 5625 per unit times how many units did we sell? Times the 7,500 units we sold. That's going to give me what per per uh, that gives me. Uh, I mean, not the 7,500 units we sold. I thought there was something wrong with that number. Not the 7,500 units we sold, but what? The 500 units that are setting, sitting in ending inventory, right? Because under absorption, we sit there and we leave those in ending inventory, don't we? Whereas under variables, we're going to expense that for all of the units, the entire 8,000. Both of them expense the 7,500 through cost of goods sold, but what? But for those 500 units in ending inventory, absorption leaves them on the balance sheet and what? And variables expenses that, right? Okay, so you take the 6, 625 times the what? Times the 500 units. That gives me 28,125. Okay, so so for variables, my income would have been what? Would have been only ninety thousand. Okay, and it would have been what? Twenty-eight thousand one twenty-five less. That's for the items that are still the cost, the fixed cost per unit that's still sitting in ending inventory under absorption. That for what? That for variables, I expense that, didn't I? I expense all of it. For all 8,000, I expense the fixed manufacturing overhead, don't I? For all 8,000, I expense the whole amount. For what? For absorption, I only expense those for the ones I've sold. I didn't sell 5,000, right? So absorption will have this $28,125 per uh, $28,125 more still sitting in ending inventory, whereas what? Under variables, we expense the whole amount, right? Um, yes, after I get the contribution margin, because I would have taken my, I mean, if you're asking me for a presentation standpoint, sales minus variable cost gives me contribution margin minus all of my fixed costs gives me my operating income, right? And the difference for the variables approach, which is what I just described, fixed cost is all fixed cost, including what? Including fixed manufacturing overhead for items I haven't sold yet. Under absorption, I only take the cost of the fixed manufacturing overhead when I sell the items through cost of goods sold, right? Right? But I haven't sold those things yet, so that's still sitting in ending inventory under absorption, whereas under variables, I've expensed all of my fixed costs, haven't I? Okay. That's it. That's the difference. Right. So the difference is what? Fixed manufacturing overhead, right? The fixed manufacturing overhead is the difference between these two, right? For the what? For the absorption, you expense everything, whether you sold it or not. <laughs> For the variables, you expense everything, whether you sold it or not. For the absorption, you do what? You only expense it or cost of goods sold it for those items that you've actually sold. Question? Because this is like, in the questions on the exam, this is sort of the expectation that you kind of understand it at this level, that you understand what's going on with those fixed manufacturing overhead and how that differs from absorption versus variables. Question? Huh? 
Oh, you're not ready. You're not ready. If this was a football team game, the other team would destroy us right now. Okay? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, good luck with that. I mean, I don't know. I can't keep loading quiz after quiz after problem after problem after problem. So you should have sufficient material now at this point. Okay, if I can quickly find them, I will, but I'm not going to – I, I got other things to do. Okay. You've got plenty of material to work with. Question? I'll see if I can do it after this. If we have time, I should maybe sit down. I'll see if I can find them in the test bank. Do they have numbers on them? Yeah. This helps. This is like you know giving you extra exercise with your for your eyes. Opportunity cost is relevant. Absolutely. Um, you know, when we're looking at um, um, option A versus option B, we're looking at which option maximizes us, right? So our opportunity cost is what? If we do this, then we'll lose that. And so we choose the one that then maximizes our profit, right? The opportunity, the, we choose the one that has the greatest opportunity cost. The greater the opportunity cost, the more we're going to want to do that particular option. Right? So opportunity cost is relevant. Right? If I use up all my capacity producing volleyball items, then I'm an idiot. Right? Because <laughs> uh, I had all this opportunity to instead do what? produce so many of the croquet sets and then anything that's left over goes to. So I'm choosing what? I'm choosing the option with the greatest opportunity cost first and then if there's anything left over, then I go ahead and I'll go with opportunity number two, right? But opportunity costs are absolutely relevant. Sunk costs are not. Okay, so sunk costs were sort of those, I forget what it was exactly in the problem where they said only 40% of the uh, fixed costs would go away of the overhead would go away. So the sunk cost is that what? That 60% that's going to stay, right? And notice we only considered the 40%. The 40%, that's not really an opportunity cost, but the 60% is a fixed cost. Opportunity cost is more when you're evaluating two options. So opportunity cost is the millions you lose as a movie star versus what? Making the choice to continue your education, right? And the what? The sunk cost is what you've already paid for your tuition. That's not relevant. Do you guys pay tuition? When I went to community college, there was no tuition. It was free. It was free when I went to college. Huh? All you had to do is pay for books. You didn't even have to pay for parking. But you guys went and voted for Trump. You should have voted. <laughs> you should have voted for Bernie Sanders. You know he was going to take us back to the future. <laughs> Who? If you would have voted for Clinton, Bernie Sanders would have been and voted for a for a Democratic. Uh, Congress, Bernie Sanders would have been the chair of the budget committee. He would have been the chair of the budget committee in Congress. You would have had a Democratic president. You would have had a Democratic Congress, and you would not be paying for tuition right now. Well, no, they should have voted for, as I said, they should have voted for the Congress as well, the House and the Senate. You wouldn't be paying for tuition right now. Instead, what's going to happen? People in Indiana are going to go get to work in an air-conditioned factory. No, only 750 of them. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> work in an air conditioning factory that frankly could probably more efficiently produce in another country and those individuals could have gone to college in for tuition free in Indiana and maybe got a better job later on but That's what they should do. Build the air conditioners and put them on the icebergs, and we'll be fine. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, any? I'm not sure what the opportunity cost is there, but someone should be able to figure that out. Huh? It's only taking a dollar salary. Huh? It's only taking a dollar salary. Yeah. Oh, some things I like what Trump's doing. I say telling, um, you know, Boeing to cut the cost of the Air Force One, I'm sure there's some fat in there. You know what? I'm going to tell you. Boeing, I'd be willing to bet, because he sold his stock last June, and they didn't back him, and that is why Boeing, he's, he's picking on Boeing. Well, that's he probably true. That well, that's probably true, but I still think there's some fat in there. <laughs> that's my I sense. I could probably... Yeah. Well, that's true. I'll, I'll tell you what. Here's what we'll do. We'll volunteer managerial accounting 101, business administration 101B. We'll go in and we'll do a budget scrub of the Boeing contract, and we'll ask for only 10% of our savings. In fact, I'll take 1% of the savings that we can get, and... Uh, We'll be in good shape. We'll be set for life, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm sure there's some money that could be saved there. Okay, anyway, guys, way off the subject. Any other questions? No? Okay, I'm going to hang out. So if there are questions, concerns um, about anything, please feel free to see me. Otherwise, I will see you or talk to you before then or see you on uh, Monday. Again, remember, 9.30 to... 11.30, be ready to work fast on these questions, okay? You need to build some speed into this now and um, bring the skinny green Scantron. Skinny green Scantron, right? 50 questions on the front, 50 questions on the back. Okay, guys, have a good rest of the day.